Okay, well, generally, I personally believe that most of the UFO information that was available in the earlier days is probably more reliable because the people who wanted to make mischief hadn't got themselves organised and the big boys hadn't got themselves organised either. We're not a very nice lot of people on planet Earth and we've been throwing sticks and stones at one another for a long time. But when we started throwing serious stuff like this, that's when the UFOs came. And I don't think it is any coincidence that UFOs arrived seriously at the beginning of our atomic age. As you know, lots of people were really concerned about animal mutilations and thought maybe space people were stealing spare parts from our animals. Well, you know, if you can travel halfway across the universe, I don't think a few bits of spare parts from our animals are going to help. I personally believe that most of the animal mutilations took place downwind from nuclear test sites. And if it wasn't the space people that were taking the samples, it was our own scientists. Dr. Barry Commoner, he asked women in the United States of America, mothers, if they would send to him the deciduous teeth of their children. And when that did happen on a big scale, they were all analysed and guess what? They all had strontium-90 in them. And because of that research, just by this one guy and his little group, the United States government stopped nuclear testing on the United States of America's own territory. They shipped it out in the Pacific and gave everyone else hell. If anybody ever tells you and talks about um, secrecy and covers up, you are now looking at one of the biggest secrets that was ever done in, in the world's history. Oak Ridge, thousands and thousands of acres it consumed more electricity than all the manufacturing of all the car industries in the United States of America. In its time, it had the biggest buildings in the United States of America. It employed thousands and thousands of people, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And everyone that was in there was sworn to secrecy. Every entrance was guarded. The people lived in there, they had schools in there, and guess what they produced? the first atomic bomb, the second atomic bomb, and the third atomic bomb. It went on in total secrecy. Of course, he wasn't very impressed. <laughs> Although I think he might have been part of the problem, he realised that in fact we would probably cro cross the line that we probably shouldn't cross. Albert Einstein, 1947, wrote, through the release of atomic energy, our generation has brought into the world the most revolution revolutionary force since prehistoric, prehistoric discovery of fire. This basic power of the universe cannot be fitted into the outmoded concept of narrow nationalisms. That says it all, doesn't it? And you know what? They didn't tell us what they were doing then, and they're not telling much more what they're doing now. Harold Hodge did enormous amounts of research under the financing of a university. Even in those early days, they were breaking all the rules. They were injecting people with radioactive isotopes, people who were in hospitals and asylums without their consent, just to find out what would happen nasty piece of work. If we'd lost the war and there'd been war crimes in the other way around, this guy would have been hung by the neck until he was dead. This man changed everything. Anyone familiar with him? Right, his specialty was propaganda. And that's, even today, his books are still used in training for people who want to influence public opinion. I suggest you look up information about him. Nasty piece of work. Okay, in 1947, all these things were happening all at once. Atomic bombs, military were getting upset, and of course, in, in June 1947, Kenneth Arnold tracked UFOs. There he is in the same plane that he used to track the UFOs, and that's his wife there. 
he actually started it, well, officially. There's a bit more of a handsome picture of him in more recent times. He's not with us anymore. Clive Tombaugh, who is the man that discovered the planet Pluto, with his wife in the desert, saw a UFO close. I was so unprepared for such a strange sight that I really, I was really petrified with astonishment. So if you're not, if you're not expecting something as big <laughs> like a UFO, if you plan and taught that there's no such animal, when it hits you, you're not ready for it. That's a map of Denmark in the background. All those pins are sightings and landings. Hans Peterson was high up in the Air Force. He's, you can see he hasn't got many pips on his shoulder here, but he eventually became a major. They scrambled up planes chasing UFOs in both directions, tracking them at thousands of kilometres an hour. Couldn't believe it. The interesting thing about Hans Peterson too is he was also a, a, an exchange um, with the United States Air Force and was in a control tower on the base where he believed that crashed UFOs were stored. And from that high position in the control tower, he was always looking towards that hangar. And even when the hangar's door was open, it was always covered by a big heavy duty curtain. But one day God interceded and blew the curtain to one side and he got a glimpse of the UFO that was parked in there. Of course, George Adamski was around at that time. This photograph was taken in 59. I don't recognize any of the people in the picture. I somehow suspect that this was probably taken at the Sydney group. Does anyone know, recognize anybody there? No. Adamski was interesting because it would seem that he was shaking hands with the military. He had contact with them and they swore to, him to secrecy on some issues and he respected that. But likewise, it would seem that the space people also who he had contact with said, look, I'm telling you this stuff, but this is not for general exhibition. So some things he would give out and some things he wouldn't. And in hindsight, we know that he was probably involved in a lot more things than we believed. That, this lady down here, I've got a pointer somewhere. I haven't got enough arms. This lady still lives in Brisbane. That's her son. That's yours truly. I, I at least made it in this picture. She was with Adamski when that, uh, he went to see the Pope and get the medal. So lots of things were happening behind the scenes that we didn't know about. Carl Jung wrote a book about UFOs. He thought it was all in people's minds. <laughs> what he didn't know at the time was that George Adamski's main secretary in Sweden, uh, in um, Switzerland, who was in fact his relative, I don't know, his cousin or whatever, don't quote me, but when she showed him that there was physical evidence that UFOs weren't in people's head, then he rewrote the book and, and he became one of us. <laughs> There's a lot of stories written about the Majestic 12. That's probably most of them there. As far as we're concerned, I suppose the main thing we need to know is that they all had lots of medals. They all had lots of experience and they all had a lot of knowledge, but they weren't going to pass too much of it on to us. Now in 1947, a very interesting development took place. The American Army, Navy and Air Force split and became three now separate organizations. And to liaise between those three separate organizations was set up the Central Intelligence Agency. Of course, it's far exceeded that brief now and it involves itself in things that we haven't even got time to go into, even if we knew all about it. But uh, once again, they don't necessarily work in our interests. Colonel Philip Corso wrote a couple of books. Anyone read his books? A couple of them? Okay. Whereas I was pretty impressed with most of the stuff, he's supposed to have visited the crash site at Roswell and reported 
that the beings, as humanoid as they were, I forget whether they had more toes and fingers or less. I think it was less. Now it is possible, as you know, there are occasionally people who have an extra thumb and there's a small group of people on this planet, I think they're Portuguese, a family, who have perfectly formed extra fingers, but that's not normal. They play musical instruments rather well. As you would if you had an extra finger, wouldn't you? If you could control it. But I suspect generally having too many digits is a bit of a liability for the brain. Although just at the moment I'd like to have a few more. Now these are all high ranking people, household names in the days, much written up about in UFO literature. You'd probably have a shoulder ache carrying that many medals, wouldn't you? Um, not my cup of tea. <laughs> Always looking serious. Here we have two important people, Hermann Oberth and not the least of which, of course, is Werner von Braun. Now, Braun Braun, as you know, built all the rockets, buzz bombs, doodle bugs for the Germans. V2s. He was a rocket expert. Needless to say, after the war, the Americans didn't want him to fall in Russian hands. So, with a project paperclip, they shipped him across to America so that he could help them with their rocket projects. He was very disappointed that his talents were underutilized. It became, I think, a little obvious to him that he was only there so the Russians couldn't have him. In more later times, he came to Australia. I don't everybody ever remember watching him on TV? Right, well they had what they called a summer school of science and the beginning of the program on the summer school of science, which was black and white TV, which I dutifully watched, it was a midday I might add, um, they had the symbol which has now been adopted by the ABC. You know the, the logo that the ABC has? Well that was first to, as part of the program with uh, Werner von Braun. And I've always believed that because von Braun knew about UFOs, that so did that guy. He certainly never spoke against them. But you see, the problem is, because the UFO's topic is surrounded by so much rubbish, garbage and ridicule, people who want to maintain some credibility won't go there. They might confide in their friends, but they won't go public on it because it, it's, they can't cope with it. I mean, I haven't got a reputation, so <laughs> I've never had one, so it doesn't really matter. I'll talk to you, anybody about UFOs till the, till the cows come home, and even sometimes they walk away like I have just stepped off of a spaceship. But I don't care about that. The truth must out. Now, von Braun started to suffer from cancer. It took him about two years to die, and the lady who was looking after him at the time, uh, another scientific lady, she has still very active in this area, and Von Braun related to her the sequence of events that were likely to take place after his death. Namely, all the wars that America would get involved in. And his forecast of the American military's behaviour has in fact come to pass. In other words, we've never actually had World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War. It's all been one continual war. You, you familiar with that image? Does that mean anything to anybody? After World War II, the, the trials. Nuremberg trials. Nuremberg trials, correct. Which is what Vaughan Braun might have found himself in had it not been for the Americans wanting him. New Guinea, Anglican Mission. Actually, Father Gill was actually at one of our conferences, wasn't he? And I sat next to him. 2003. 2003, thank you. I tell you what, talk about Mr. Cool. <laughs> he was such a lovely man. There's no side to him. It was, it, was, it was a treat just to be in his company. 
It wasn't like being near the Dalai Lama. You didn't so get all vibrate, but you know, you just knew that there was something really solid right there. I'm sorry, that's the best picture I could find of him on in the internet. It, it seems to be a great, sh good shortage of sharp pictures of him. I cut that one off a movie actually, but anyway, that's him. Now, Mr. Class, he's an awful piece of work, and even the the scientific community <laughs> wouldn't give him benefit of the time of day. Even they lost patience with him. They didn't like him at all. He just kept attacking everybody. It's a classic example of, well, it's almost, we <laughs> haven't built a word around the word class because he was su such a nasty piece of work. But he didn't want anybody, and he, anyone that talked about UFOs, even if it was Gill with his 38 witnesses who was interviewed, as we know, by all sorts of famous people. When the debate is lost, slander becomes the tool of the loser. Well, maybe he knew that he was losing all the time, I don't know. James MacDonald, he came to Brisbane. Does anybody go to his lecture? No? Somewhere in your house, I think, there's, a, there's a, the original movie on film. So if you, if you find a roll of film, that's actually MacDonald being filmed when he came to the University of Queensland. We had him in the lecture theatre there. He wouldn't back down either. But unfortunately, he came to a sad end. He had a lot of enemies. The main enemy he caused was probably the development of the first supersonic uh, super constellation. Um, what is it? The one that goes up above, above the clouds anyway. He stopped its manufacture in the United States of America because of the damage that it would do to something we'd never heard of in those days, namely the ozone layer. What's this on, guy on about? But that was his specialty, atmospheric physics. And he forecast that it would do far too much damage to the ozone layer. British went ahead and built their, their uh, Concorde, but um, it's no longer in service for long, lots of reasons. Then we had uh, Alan Hynek. He came to Brisbane to our group and gave a talk. Poor old Alan Hynek, he sort of had one foot in both camps for a long time. He, he didn't know what to do, but eventually he came over to our side. He interviewed lots of people, lots of reports. There he is with uh, Valet. Are you familiar with Valet? Anyone read Valet's books? Yeah, not one of my favourite researchers. I think he was a bit into the funny farm stuff, but still it was the best we could do in those days. This is a pretty straight sort of a guy. You've got the book in the library there, have you? The Report on Unidentified Objects by Rupel. You should have. That's one of the best books. In fact, they wanted him to rewrite it. They wanted to change it years later, and he wouldn't change it. He stood by it. Yep. As he died of a heart attack, quite unexpectedly. But his, his neighbours said that they were quite surprised. He was very healthy, a nice guy. The lady who survived her husband said that um, they used to travel daily in the car to work. They were both working at a military base. And he just died at work with a heart attack suddenly, as indeed you can. Uh, Wavery Gervin, have you got the, his book in the library? I Flying Sources, pun? I think it's in the master library. Right, Flying Sources and Common Sense, a really down-to-earth, sensible, practicable book. It's years since I've read it, but I could still recommend it to anybody. We need more common sense. As far as I can understand, there is no university on this planet that specialises in common sense and there's a great shortage on many campuses. Been there and got scars to prove it. Timothy Good was also a guest with UFO Research Queensland. 2006, 2006 thank you with the memories. <laughs> <laughs> I met him in London as well. He's actually a professional violinist and used to play with the London Symphony, I think it was. He's written a lot of books. He's really donated a huge slab of his personal life to UFOs. Now, these two guys are not very popular. Anyone familiar with them? Yes. Diseases from space. They don't go along with the Big Bang Theory. They don't go along with anything that orthodox scientists tend to keep promoting. 
They believe that life is constant throughout the universe and microorganisms arrive here giving us constant updates to our DNA. That's why wherever you go in the universe, you're going to find people like us who have the same problems and virtues. Uh, so Fred Hoyle's now dead, but he's um, Singaporean, not Singaporean. Um, I wish I wouldn't keep changing the names of countries. It's a real nuisance anyway. He's, anyway, it used to be Ceylon. What's Ceylon now? Sri Lanka, thank you. His Sri Lankan friend is still writing books and still active, I believe. And of course we have Eisenhower. Now contrary to what most people think, it was actually General Eisenhower, or President Eisenhower as he was by that time, who started National Space and Aeronautics. And he did so against the advice of his top advisors. And he converted something in the order of something like 100,000 military personnel into civilians, not to put a man on the moon, the original wording that formed NASA was, are you listening? To study craft from space. Of course, that's been changed now. Everyone thinks it was all about building the moon, but it was to study craft from space. And as you know, Eisenhower went from being a hawk to a dove. In fact, he did everything he could to prevent the two nuclear weapons being dropped on Japan. He didn't think it was a good idea at all. He was responsible, of course, for setting up the program that took the first three guys in Apollo to the moon. And just for the hell of it, I've given you a, an update here because the whole of the space program has made it possible to have these photographs which don't come up very good colour on that screen and nothing like the ones I'm looking at. But these are the ones that were recently taken by NASA's Curiosity rover. And you can see here that we've got what they claim was originally sort of a lake, a pond, and all this water used to rush down there and we've got a mountain in the background. But it's dry. Now the interesting thing is that I was watching a talk by an astronomer an astrophysicist the other day on the internet who said that he's been studying the planets in our solar system for several years and reports that they're all suffering climate change like us. They're all drying up at the moment. So that's jolly interesting, isn't it? I don't think too many people want to hear that in the upper echelons. Uh, those of you who've been watching TV lately may have seen that wonderful series in Egypt where it doesn't show you photographs as clear as that from satellites, but it was actually revealing what was under the desert in Egypt. Anybody see that show? It was amazing, wasn't it? Not hundreds, but thousands of villages and cities under the desert in Egypt. And apparently when it got all dry, all those years ago, everyone had to quit and go and live on the edges of the Nile River. And of course, subsequently, it's all been buried in sand. But we've now got satellites that can scan under the sand. And of course, if we've got that, we can only presume that the UFO people would have much better technology than that. They could probably even be watching this TV screen now. <laughs> it's not worth it really, but still, they have those potentials, I believe. And we've still got some really strange ideas on this planet. We laugh at tribal people, we laugh at people in the history, but you know, we've, we've still got our images which are almost part of our culture. And I believe that's one of them. I don't think there are beings like that. And these funny looking eyes, just the, the, the whole image doesn't fit into anything that's sensible or cosmological. As indeed that doesn't. Anybody recognize that lady? It's Nicole Kidman, I'm reliably informed. Yes. So see how they can distort images and do anything to befuddle our brains and our minds and our belief systems. So please be on guard about nonsense. It's everywhere, especially in the areas where we are a little unknown. Now there's an elephant's eye, there's a fly's eye, and there's an eagle's eye. Are they 
Any difference in size? Not very much. So why would a space critter or a grey, whatever you like to call them, have great big eyes when that's all you need? This bird here can see from kilometers, nearly kilometers up a mouse on the ground. Whereas we have a thousand pixels in our eyes, it has a million and that can see beyond our spectrum. My computer has also got a camera built in it. I can only just see it here. Why would I want an eye that covers half of my face when we've got technology? Even if, even if that image is a robot, it doesn't need eyes as big as that. That's just Hollywood rubbish as far as I'm concerned. Sorry if I'm upsetting people. Um, it's interesting technically how when people have retired, when their credibility and their business doesn't depend on talking about UFOs, that's when they let the secrets out. The Canadian Defence Minister, have anybody read that? That's 2010. Many military officers are coming out of the UFO closet to share what they truly believe is a phenomena that is worth disclosing and investigating further. These testimonies from our astronauts, ex-military, are the most important issues of our time and they will affect your children, children's future and their children's. This topic is a serious topic and it needs to be embraced as such. Neither rubbish or accepting rubbish. Now this man's nothing whatsoever to do with the UFOs except that he retired from the CIA after a very long career. And he is so unhappy with the nasty things that the CIA are doing that he's now a whistleblower, a public activist, and he gave them back his medals. What? Yes. The relative is that the CIA still are interfering with the truth and our daily lives. We are all living in the dark. And if you Google GE and check how many companies GE is connected to, that's virtually all the mass media, all the weapons manufacturing, everything that sets up and runs wars and keeps this planet in a state of war. Because as you probably realize, during wartime, we have economic peace. During peacetime, we have economic war. There's always money for sport and war. The banks will release unlimited quantities of money for making destructive machinery that's going to be destroyed. Now this lady, she was one of their, what do they call them, assets? Okay, well she is an asset too. But she was working for the CIA as an asset. And she married this guy, Wilson, and they asked him, because he was involved in uh, some foreign diplomatic corps, they asked him to release information that Saddam Hussein had had access to yellow cake. And he refused to do it. He said, I don't tell lies like that. So they exposed her and she lost, lost a job. That's the end of her. I mean, once they tell you, tell the world who you are, you're not any good to anyone. Anyone in, in, in knowing about this guy? X. And what do they kill him with? Right, polonium 210, which is an alpha emitter. They can put on a doorknob and you touch the doorknob and you'll die. That's what he looked like. And a few months later, he looked like that prematurely aged. Now alpha uh, polonium 210 uh, won't hurt you on the outside, it's only when it gets inside you and because it's only an alpha emitter you can translate it, transfer it through airports because airports are only scanning for gamma radiation not for alpha. Once the medical people in London found out what he had died from then they went out with their scanners and found polonium 210 throughout the railway lines and cafes and restaurants, buses, everywhere he had been, they, tr they tracked it. And someone asked me a question, why is he here? Well, I told you he was gonna be part of the deal, didn't I? 
because they killed him with the same stuff. None of us are safe. <laughs> it's to do with the UFO subject to show you that the people in the top are very powerful. They run things all the time. It may yet be another 60 years when we're still meeting here with long beards talking about whether UFOs exist or not because it's going to be very difficult. As you know, the, one of the top, the top lady in America who's claiming she wants to be president has said that when she gets in, she will lift the secrecy lift, lid off UFOs. Yes, pull the other one. It plays jingle bells. We've had promises like that before. I bet it doesn't happen. And that's the end, folks. <laughs> <laughs>
they could come from another planet and travel that fast as if they were, could resist all the, the g-forces so they'd have to be a giant insect but of course we know it's different altogether don't know don't know i i like to stay with the explainable and the known i've been down those slippery slopes before and you, you find a lot of mud at the bottom so i i far as possible i have an open mind but i there are limits as to where i'm prepared to go until someone can explain how it can be done i i i i, I do believe in miracles because i think the whole universe is a miracle if you know what I've seen. And I do believe that some things are supernormal, but I don't believe in supernatural. Supernormal, but not supernatural. Can we just take one more one question? One more question, Maybe yeah. from someone who hasn't asked one yet. Is there anyone else? Anyone game? <laughs> With the, you were saying that one guy who wrote a book on... Um, of which? His his cousin his cousin was Sigmund Freud. Thank you. I couldn't think of his name. Okay, and he he just knows how to bend words and manipulate people's minds. But he did say that he can sometimes he could influence. A million people's minds who said, there's always one I can't get. <laughs> yeah, read his books. But if you want to know more about him, go to my website. Yes, 40s. Yeah, yeah. If you go to my website, Australia. there's a lot of stuff about him there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, he can manipulate people's minds. Yeah. Because people, in the main, people aren't thinking. They just want to be led, really. We're, we're, we're sheep. Well, thank you very much for your time and patience because we were slow starting. <laughs>